The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retained are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. What a glorious day today is. It's beautiful outside here in Kentucky. The sun is shining. It's kind of warm in here, kind of. But praise God, because that means that beautiful people of God have returned to the God of mercy. And a principle that is in God's nature is that he does something marvelous with our misery. He does something marvelous with our, mis our, min our misery. He is incredible. And today's Holy Gospel shows us misery in St. Thomas. St. Thomas gets to hear about how everyone else 
has seen Jesus in the resurrection, but he hasn't seen him yet. He hasn't seen him at the tomb as Mary Magdalene did. He didn't see him, em the empty tomb as John and St. Peter did. He didn't see Jesus on the road to Emmaus like Cleopas and the other, uh, other disciple. St. Thomas has been deprived of Jesus. He doesn't have Jesus and he doesn't know where he is, similar to Mary Magdalene who talks to the gardener, Jesus, and says, they've taken my Lord, I don't know where they have placed him. And Jesus says to Mary her name, that he calls her by her name, knowing her from the beginning of time, Mary. And she says, Rabboni, teacher. She recognizes him. But Thomas hasn't got this. What has he done that Jesus hasn't revealed himself to him? Well, Thomas, of course, according to St. John, his name means twin. St. John used this opportunity to remind Thomas for all eternity that he was a doubter, that for all time, St. Thomas would be known as Doubting Thomas, two-minded, the one who believed in Jesus but had some doubts. That's miserable. Doubting is miserable. The uncertainty of the future is miserable. It is difficult. There are things in this life and in this world that we can't control, and we, all of us, have been witnesses to misery, especially in these last three years. Wherever you come from, wherever, you're, wherever you lived, wherever you were quarantined, it was miserable. And the ridiculousness of it was even more miserable as far as the persecution of the people of this world. Misery comes to us, doubt comes to us, but God does something marvelous with misery. What does he do for St. Thomas today? He doesn't leave him in his doubt. He comes to St. Thomas after eight days, after eight days of Thomas hearing everybody, getting the privilege of seeing Jesus, getting to encounter him, even being called by their name by Jesus. After eight days on that resurrection octave, St. Thomas gets another privilege. He says in his doubt, I will not believe unless I stick my finger into the nail marks. I will not believe until I stick my hand into his side. I will not believe until I have tangible evidence of Jesus. If you say that he's resurrected in the body, if you encountered him, if you saw him, if you saw the empty tomb, I want more proof. Sounds like us. Boy, does it sound like us. I want proof, Jesus. Show me you're real. Show me you're here. Show me that the power of your resurrection has touched my life because it doesn't seem like it. So Jesus comes to St. Thomas on that eighth day, the glorious octave, and he says, peace be with you. Now this harkens back, of course, to when he said in John 14, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but my peace I give to you. Their peace, the world's peace, is full of corruption, misery, chaos. But my peace I give to you. They didn't know what that meant till this moment. For the apostles, it means the forgiveness of sins. They're given this power. For St. Thomas, it goes a little bit further. He gets to touch Jesus. He gets to put his finger in the nail marks and in the side. And Jesus, after he says, peace be with you, he looks right at Thomas and says, you wanted it, Thomas? You asked with belief, even though you doubted? I'm going to give it to you. You wanted to encounter me. You wanted my passion, death, and resurrection to be seen and touched. I've got something planned for you, Thomas. You asked uh, something of me, and I'm gonna let you do it. Come here, Thomas. Put your finger in my nail marks. Thomas, don't be unbelieving. Stick your hand in my side. Know that I am resurrected, and that this is the resurrection of the body, and this is my plan for this world, and that the Heavenly Father's plan has come to fruition. Jesus is 
that man crucified for us. But for St. Thomas, St. Thomas, he is the recipient, the recipient of God's mercy. Jesus had promised them, I will see you again and your heart will rejoice, John 16. He gave them the forgiveness of sins, but he also, through those forgiveness of sins, we are beneficiaries of his mercy. St. Thomas is our example. That's why he's the gospel today. He is the main character of the gospel. He touches Jesus. The wounds of Jesus Christ, those blessed wounds that win our salvation, He comes to St. Thomas so that St. Thomas would not be unbelieving anymore. And then Jesus goes further and says, blessed are those who have not seen but still believed. That's you and me. That's us. Who have not got to touch his nail marks, have not got to stick our hand in his side. Blessed are we who believe without seeing. But we are still beneficiaries of God's love and mercy. We are still showered by his love and mercy constantly in that forgiveness of sins. And what do we do with unbelief? unbelief? What do we do with doubt? What what do we do with the bad of this world, the evil of this world? Well, you have to wait, because I have another talk later. But for St. Thomas, the importance of this Mass, the importance of this day, for St. Thomas, he becomes an example for us, because mercy is love's second name. If God is love, God is also mercy. God is love, and God so loved the world that he sent his son to suffer and die for us. That's not just some hypothetical. That is not something that we can just read in a book. That has ramifications in your life and in mine. That we might profit from what he did on the cross and did at the tomb. Do you realize that? Because this is the good news, and this is what transforms uneducated apostles, disciples of Jesus Christ, into the 12 apostles sent to the whole world to preach this love and mercy. That ultimately, we have profited from the misery of this world. Adam and Eve sin all the way through the doubting and the idolatry of the Hebrew people, all the way up to Judas's betrayal, the misery of this world is no match for God's mercy. Us profiting from mercy, from misery is God's mercy. This is God's mercy. The merits of Jesus Christ, passion, death, and resurrection applied to us. The word in Latin is misericordia. If you are here last year, I said this before, but it means that in our miseria, God has a cordis, a heart, for misery. As you look up into our apps, you see the prodigal son coming back to the merciful father. And it says in Luke's gospel, he was moved with mercy. Mercy is God moving towards us in our misery. This is why the audacity of Jesus to say, the greater the sinner, the more right he has to my mercy, to St. Faustina. And the diary records God's divine mercy in her soul. But mercy is not new. It's not new because it's it's who God is. This is why St. Paul, he says, if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him by the death of his son, it is all the more certain that we who have been reconciled will be saved by his life. Not only that, we go so far as to make God our boast through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That's in Romans 5. What does that mean? That means that the merits of Jesus Christ on the cross, his passion, death, and resurrection by God being moved with mercy, we now are reconciled with God. We are saved. Our life, we have eternal life. This is God's mercy for us in our misery. His misericordia moves, motus est, is moved upon us who are sinners. 
And that's why he says to the Corinthians, St. Paul does, your faith then does not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. This is what's incredible about the gospel is that it's not dependent on what you and me do. I can't earn God's mercy. Why? Because it's on him. It's what he has done for me in my miseria, in my misery. The love of Christ impels us, St. Paul says, that we who have re reached the conviction that one died for all, all died. We all died with Jesus in his miseria, in his passion. But that's not the end. He died for all so that those who live, us, might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised up for us. We live no longer for ourselves. If we do, if we rely on ourselves, we are still in our miseria. We are still in that misery. That's why St. Alphonsus Liguori says that he who trusts in himself is a fool. He who trusts in God is saved. This is why Jesus came to St. Faustina and said, trust in my mercy. Trust. Trust in what I have done for you. Tell sinners to trust in my mercy. No matter how big the sinner, the greater right he or she has to my mercy. God wants us to be part of his family. He wants us to be recipients of his mercy. And we have been become witnesses of this mercy because St. John tells us in our gospel today, the things that he wrote in his gospel, this account of St. Thomas's doubting and coming to believe, they are written so that we would believe, so that we, we who have not seen, but still put our faith in God, that we may have life through the name of Jesus Christ. These are empowered apostles, empowered disciples under the banner of Christ who are witnessing day in and day out to God's love and mercy for us. This is why we can forgive sins. This is why we ask for forgiveness of those who trespass against us and those of us who have trespassed against one another. This is why we must be mutually forgiving. This is why we must love one another as Christ has loved us. This is the motive for the gospel. He is moved with mercy. God so loved the world. His mercy endures forever, as the psalmist says. St. John Paul II said, people are made for happiness. Rightly then, you thirst for happiness. Christ has the answer to this desire of yours, but he asks you to trust him. See, trust is part of mercy. How do we do that in a bad, broken, miserable world? How do I do that? How do I do that? First, we turn to him. We no longer turn away from the cross and Jesus' passion and death and resurrection. We turn to him. Conversio adeum. We convert our life towards him. And that begins with the first step. That means saying we're sorry. That means asking for forgiveness for my sins. Before I forgive anybody else, I better receive God's mercy because I'm not strong enough on my own to forgive you or you to forgive me. Mercy is what empowers us to give that forgiveness. So we will explore God's mercy this afternoon, but we need to have the preamble. We need to have the preface of knowing that God's love and mercy comes in a crucified package. If you want to open God's mercy, you've got to come to his wounds. You've got to trust in him by turning to him. And we, like St. Saint, Saint Thomas, we get to be recipients of that love and mercy, and it transforms us. St. Thomas might be the first, quote-unquote, theologian. Why? Because he went from doubt to questioning, inquisiting, to being an ambassador of God's hypostatic union. He said, in response to putting his hands in Jesus' side, putting his finger in Jesus' nail marks, 
the first person to say, by your wounds, Jesus, I am healed. He cried out the cry of his heart, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God, my Lord, your human nature, Jesus has suffered and died for me, my God, you have made up for what is lacking in humanity by dying for us. You have divine justice and mercy. You are divine justice and God's mercy. So that's why God, Jesus comes, of course, to St. Faustina and says, let the greatest sinners place their trust in my mercy. They have the right before others to trust in the abyss of my mercy. I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes an appeal to my compassion. But on the contrary, I justify him in my unfathomable and inscrutable mercy. In our miseria, God does something marvelous, something amazing, something that changes our lives. And we become ambassadors of God's mercy. The merits of Jesus Christ, the blood and water poured forth from the cross are placed upon my soul, washing me clean, washing me whiter than snow. And that's why at every mass we cry out right before you receive Jesus into your heart, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. I'm not worthy to receive you because I am in miseria. I am in misery. I am struggling. There are things in my life that I can't control and they really stink to high heaven. But that's not the end. Jesus is the answer. Jesus has the answer to the cry, cry of our heart in our miseria. He comes to us in mercy. We turn to him today. We turn to him with our hearts. Like St. Thomas, maybe we question, maybe we wonder, maybe we're still inquisitive. Good, good. That's awesome. We are still struggling with sins of the flesh, the world, the devil. Good, good. There's still persecution in the world. Good, I'm glad. There is still miseria out there. Jesus, have mercy on us sinners. Jesus, we cry out, increase our faith. Jesus, we cry out that we are not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and we shall be healed because you are our rock and refuge in our miseria. You are the heart moved with, our, with mercy for us who are still walking in the shadow of the valley of death. God, have mercy on us. This is our cry and this is why Jesus comes to us and doesn't leave us alone. He comes in his body, blood, soul, and divinity to each one of us to wipe away our sins, to save us from the misery of this life. And we cry out like St. Thomas today, something marvelous in our misery. His love and mercy endure forever, my Lord and my God.